Okay, thank you very much to, to, for the invitation. Um, actually, let me just uh, correct my title. I'm not talking about the EU as, as a whole, I'm just talking about uh, the Euro area. Um, also, of course, what I'm saying is just my, my own opinion, not, ne not necessarily the opinion of the European Commission. Um, yeah, so let me, uh, so what I, what I would like to do is to, um, to look at medium-term uh, growth trends in the, in the Euro area, but um, uh, structure my discussion around the, um, the financial crisis which, uh, which started in, uh, in late uh, 2000, 2008 in, uh, in Europe. And what I would like to do is to, uh, to see uh, to what extent uh, the, uh, the, the crisis had impacts on, uh, on, uh, on growth in Europe, uh, especially how, how, how big was the impact so far, especially on, on trend growth and what is likely, what, what are the likely future developments. But of course, when we talk about, uh, about uh, these events, we also have to talk about um, the, um, the events which, uh, which led to the, uh, to, to the crisis, and we also have to look at the trends, and we somehow have to try to, uh, to disentangle um, the impact uh, of the crisis from, uh, from the trends, which were, uh, or, which were already um, uh, showing in some direction uh, before the crisis. Now, as I said, the year 2008 uh, marks uh, the start of the uh, longest recession experienced in Europe in the post-war period. So the, um, the accumulated output loss uh, for the euro area since 2008 is, uh, amounts to 3.1%, so that's the absolute uh, loss of, uh, of GDP. Uh, if you take uh, 2008 as, uh, as a reference year, and according to Commission forecasts, only at the end of uh, 2015 will output losses from the financial crisis be uh, recovered in, uh, in absolute terms. Now, I already um, uh, talked briefly about the question, so what I, what I want to address is first uh, what have been the, the drivers of growth before the, before the crisis, um, was there um, excessive capital? So that's that's one, I guess, one one important uh, uh, possible um, hypothesis. Uh, and second, uh, have medium-term growth determinants been negatively affected by uh, financial crisis? And if yes, uh, which uh, which uh, determinants uh, can we identify? Um, then third, um, how could a medium-term adjustment pass? Uh, I'm thinking here of 10-year uh, of ahead uh, projection, projections look like. And then I'll uh, talk very uh, briefly about uh, um, one policy uh, that, is, uh, that is advocated in the European Union, uh, namely uh, structural reforms and their impact, uh, their impact on growth. And uh, there is a discussion about, uh, about such, uh, such measures in the current environment, which is characterized by, uh, by constrained monetary policy. And there are, there are critics of, uh, of, this, uh, of, of this approach. So I've, I start by uh, first giving you a very short uh, model description. Um, then I talk about the pre-crisis trends uh, and uh, the medium-term outlook and this uh, policy, this short policy discussion. So the, um, what the Commission, but also other institutions like the OECD or the IMF uh, 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 use when they, um, when they do medium-term projection, they basically apply an, uh, a so-called augmented uh, solo growth model. So that's the, that's the workhorse, I think, for many, for many institutions, and that's also, that's also my workhorse. I'm not going through this, uh, through this model. What's, uh, what's important uh, in, this, in my context is simply the first equation, the, uh, the production function, uh, because this, uh, this in, a, in a sense, uh, yeah, gives the, or gives an idea on the determinants which are which will be important uh, for medium-term trends in my in my analysis. So as you know, uh, output uh, is produced according to the uh, to the neoclassical production uh, model by by capital. Uh, it is capital is uh, um, 
uh, can be can be subject to uh, different degrees of capacity utilization, which is uh, um, which is uh, denoted by this variable U C. So capital and its and capacity utilization is one is one important factor. Um, then the second uh, second factor is employment, which is this variable L, and the third the third factor is the efficiency the efficiency of labor uh, this variable E. So I'm not talking about the uh, the other uh, the other determinants, but I'll I will come back to to uh, some of these uh, these these equations uh, later on. Okay, so let me then uh, look at individual at these individual determinants, namely uh, total factor productivity. Then I will talk about employment, and then I will talk about about capital. And I'll structure my presentation by yeah, by giving a first uh, um, a bit of a historic um, uh, view of developments in uh, in Europe. Then I'll talk about the crisis, and then I talk about uh, the outlook. Now, for Europe, um, what we can see is that there is a um, there is a period. If you look from uh, from the late uh, 60s, but of course we could start earlier. Of, um, of successful technological catching up uh, with the frontier economy, in this case, uh, probably the, the United States. But uh, this process of, uh, of, uh, of uh, catching up growth, uh, in, or technological growth, has, uh, has slowed down over time. Now, um, what I'm showing you here is our absolute values. Now, the US, the US TFP growth uh, over the whole period is roughly, is roughly 1%. So you can see in the in this in the late 60s, uh, Europe was doing very well relative to relative to United States, but we also see that uh, the early 90s uh, marks somewhat of a, of a watershed in, uh, in 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 the growth experience. Maybe that's the that's the period where uh, Europe's uh, TFP growth was uh, on average uh, falling below the uh, TFP growth in the uh, in the United States. Now, this is not uh, universally true for, uh, for all countries, and this you see by uh, these, um, these upper and, and lower um, uh, graphs, which uh, show the, uh, the, 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 upper, the upper line shows the, the, the maximum performers, the good performers, while the, uh, the, the lower line shows the, the bad performers. These are not necessarily always the same, uh, the same countries, but you can see that um, that uh, for for quite a number of European countries, um, it was uh, it was possible to actually sustain relatively high uh, high growth rates. These of of technical uh, of technical progress. These were especially countries like Ireland, but also uh, the Scandinavian countries. Now, if we look at um, at uh, when this divergence of uh, of technology. Um, uh, when it occurred and how it how it affected individual uh, groups, I think we can um, we can uh, identify basically three groups uh, which uh, started to diverge at different uh, times from uh, from the U.S. Uh, technology trend. Uh, the first uh, the first group, namely the uh, let's say the Mediterranean countries, uh, uh, which are denoted by this by the dotted line, uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy. Uh, and, and Greece, uh, they um, they diverged uh, from the U.S. Uh, from the U.S. TFP growth uh, growth rates already in the in the early uh, early 90s. Then uh, we have a second group of countries which we can denote as the let's say the northern continental uh, European countries. These would be Germany, Belgium, France, the Netherlands, and uh, Austria. They started to uh, to diverge from the uh, or fall below uh, U.S. trend growth around uh, uh, 1997, and then we have the this this, uh, this third group of countries, which are the Scandinavian countries, the U.K. and Ireland, which uh, sustained high TFP growth for uh, for a long time, but uh, also. Uh, uh, eventually uh, diverged from uh, from the U.S. Uh, and this process of uh, of decline of TFP uh, growth uh, happened uh, yeah, a couple of years, or started to to, to occur uh, a couple of years before the financial crisis. 
Now, this is the bad news. This was the bad news that um, the, there is uh, TFP divergence. Now, the question, the first question related to um, to the crisis, is um, how has the crisis affected uh, TFP growth in the uh, in the euro area, and and what is our what is our current assessment of uh, of uh, how the crisis has affected uh, trend TFP. Now this this graph here shows you the uh, a plot of the of the actual TFP uh, um, uh, trend, the level, uh, this, which is the, the solid line, and the, um, the 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 dashed line is the is our trend. As you can see, um, the crisis actually had quite a strong effect on uh, on actual uh, TFP in uh, in in the euro area. If you again take 2008 as the as a benchmark here, then um, Europe has not uh, seen any uh, TFP growth uh, since uh, since this year 2008. Nevertheless, uh, we are of the opinion that uh, the crisis so far has not has not really affected the trend uh, TFP growth. So the the dotted li the, the dashed line is uh, is still uh, solidly uh, unkinked. Um, and our explanation for why this is happening is uh, that Europe is currently experiencing a quite low uh, degree of uh, capacity utilization. This is the, uh, this is the dotted line. Uh, you see before the crisis we had uh, relatively uh, mild fluctuations of uh, capacity utilization in, uh, in Europe and these, uh, these fluctuations these mild fluctuations also coincide with cyclical fluctuations of, uh, of TFP. However, since 2009, we do observe uh, quite a, a robust and, uh, and persistent uh, decline of, um, of capacity utilization. There was a, there was a drop, uh, a very strong drop in 2009, which was then uh, followed by a bit of a recovery but then, since 2011, we uh, see another another uh, drop of capacity utilization. So so far, um, what the, the data suggests is that um, uh, we we can be optimistic concerning the trend. Of course, we cannot be. Uh, we must be concerned about uh, the fact that uh, uh, capacity utilization rates uh, are so uh, are so low um, since uh, since the uh, financial crisis and which uh, indicates that there are uh, severe uh, demand problems in the um, euro area economy. Uh, let me skip this. Let me, let me move to, um, to employment. So I'm not giving you a, a historic uh, overview of, uh, of employment trends in, in Europe. Uh, here I just want to uh, look at the impacts of the crisis on, on employment, since employment is, according to our analysis, uh, one of the components which have been hit very, uh, very strongly. Now, employment uh, basically can be, um, if you abstract from, uh, from variations in, uh, in average hours work per person, uh, employment uh, can be uh, divided up into uh, uh, population of working age growth, into uh, changes in the participation rate, and uh, changes in the unemployment rate, and what I'm what I'm showing here is the is the trend uh, contribution. So I'm not looking at the unemployment rate. I'm looking what we call uh, the NAVRU. Now um, there is a there is some sort of an of a demographically related uh, uh, um, shift of employment, which uh, somehow coincides with the um, uh, with the start of the. Um, uh, of, the, of the financial crisis, which is a drop in the growth rate of the of working age population, so that there is a natural uh, uh, reduction in uh, in labor supply and labor input at, at around that time, and that of course has to be taken into account when we talk about uh, the effects of the crisis, since this is not a this is a, a not a negligible uh, part of the of of the actual movement. Uh, unlike in the uh, in the U.S., it has been mentioned this morning that um, in the U.S. We, we see little, or we see a, a stabilization of unemployment, but in the U.S. we see uh, a, a, a very uh, strong reduction in the participation rate. Now, this has not happened in uh, in, in Europe. The participation rate is still, at least at the aggregate level, is still uh, is still rising. So there was little impact 
of the crisis on, on participation. However, uh, the, the crisis had quite a, in, in Europe quite a strong uh, impact on the, uh, on the NAVRU. Uh, before the crisis, we had a period where the NAVRU was declining. So before the crisis, there was some degree of uncertainty to what extent uh, decline in the, in the NAVRU was actually indicating, um, yeah, um, uh, it was indicating that structural reforms in labor market may have uh, may have uh, improved the uh, the unemployment uh, situation structurally in Europe. However, the um, the uh, financial crisis has uh, shown that uh, this uh, decline of the uh, the of the NAVRU was to a large extent probably a demand a demand driven uh, phenomenon. And the NAVRU has increased uh, since the, the crisis from about 8% uh, to, uh, to 12%. And the big uh, question, obviously, is especially for medium-term uh, projections and also the projections that I that I am uh, using, what sort of assumptions can we make about uh, the future evolution of the NAVRU? Will the NAVRU stay at, this, uh, at the 12% level in Europe, or will the NAVRU uh, decline? To what um, to this uh, to this dashed line, which, uh, which which we would call the structural the structural level uh, of unemployment. Now, in in the projections that I'm uh, that 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 are underlying my analysis, we are um, we are assuming that um, there will there, there are hysteresis effect, and we see that these hysteresis effects are are strong in because we get these these these, these long medium term cycles. Of the uh, of the Navru, but uh, we also given uh, given the, the historic fluctuations of the Navru around the what we call the structural rate, we are of the opinion that uh, at least in the in the medium term, so over a 10-year uh, period, uh, the Navru will um, uh, will fall. However, it will probably not decline to uh, to levels uh, of the Navru that we have seen before. Uh, before the crisis, uh, unless uh, there are uh, certain certain structural measures taken uh, in labor markets, also of course because of fiscal pressures, uh, it could very well be that um, taxes need to be increased in order to to balance the budget, um, which could have uh, negative implications on uh, also on structural unemployment rates. So we we don't know exactly, but we are uh, what will happen. But we we do not we are not of the opinion. That uh, the, the uh, structural and the NAVRU will be will stay at 12% in uh, in Europe. Now the um, the third uh, the third determinant uh, uh, the third determinant capital formation, which is an, an, an especially important one in the context of the um, of the financial crisis, since uh, it, the financial crisis has a lot to do with, uh, with uh, overinvestment, especially in, in residential uh, construction. And there, the question therefore arises uh, uh, how much overinvestment was there uh, in the pre crisis period, um, and how much underinvestment is there in the crisis period, and third, uh, what could be the speed uh, of um, the recovery of the uh, investment rate. Now um, that's a, that's a tricky issue, and um, what I'm what I'm showing you here is the um, it, it, the, the dashed line is the is the investment to um, to potential output uh, ratio, and the uh, red uh, solid line that uh, that is the uh, investment rate that uh, our model would uh, would give if we would calculate. Uh, uh, if we would calculate uh, a capital stock, which would be consistent with the TFP trend and the uh, employment trend, which I've just uh, talked about. Now that is interesting in the in the sense that it gives an it gives a, somewhat of an idea to what extent there might have been overinvestment before uh, before the crisis, and also it gives an idea to what extent we might have uh, been able to pick up. Uh, um, some, um, yeah, some, some, some divergences of uh, investment rates from uh, from fundamentals uh, before uh, before the crisis. Now, as you can see from uh, from this graph, um, uh, the um, 
the investment to potential output ratio before the crisis or before uh, before 2000 before 2004 was actually more or less well aligned with uh, with uh, these uh, these fundamental uh, variable and we see starting in 2004 we see a, we see a divergence uh, so there was uh, there was overinvestment um, now uh, somewhat surprisingly uh, Despite the fact that investment rates have fallen uh, so strongly, um, uh, this indicator does not uh, does not show a lot of underinvestment, or actually does not show any underinvestment at the, in the in the in the current juncture. Um, so the um, which has uh, which is partly uh, maybe answers uh, some um, some questions about uh, to what extent is there a, a credit crunch according to this. Uh, to these figures, there is not so much uh, a sign of, a, of an active uh, credit uh, restrictions by, by banks. So it seems to be more uh, the, 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 the strong decline of investment from, let's say, 22% uh, from 22% to, to currently 18% is, uh, is um, in, in, according to this, to this view, would be explained as a correction of overinvestment before, and of course. Um, it's also um, a result. Uh, we, we should not necessarily see this as a as a causal uh, relationship from uh, um, uh, let's say from supply side determinants onto investment. But the fact that investment has fallen has itself uh, had its had itself uh, quite strong impacts on the uh, on the supply side determinants. For example, employment is 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 an endogenous variable. So the fact that that investment has dropped uh, so much. Also meant that the uh, that structural unemployment uh, went up in Europe, so that's partly partly explains uh, why there is this uh, strong uh, drop in, of investment. But nevertheless, if we take that into account, uh, there is on top of that there is not an additional um, let's say credit crunch factor which is uh, um, uh, which would drive the investment rate below uh, below these uh, supply side factors. Now, if you if you think that the um, that this model of investment is not uh, is not the most plausible one, uh, you can uh, I can also show you um, what you would get if you would have a, uh, if you would adhere to the accelerator model. So, if you would have have a more demand uh, driven view of investment. And uh, there you see a similar a similar story emerging. So again, uh, here the, uh, the the red line is the actual uh, investment rate, and the uh, the green line would be the uh, investment that would be predicted by uh, by this accelerator model. Now, again, uh, a very similar story. Uh, the accelerator model explains relatively well the investment uh, fluctuations. Uh, until the beginning of 2000, and then uh, starting in 2000, there is this uh, there is this investment boom, which cannot be explained by by fundamental factors. So neither by supply side factors, nor by uh, nor by demand side factors. Um, um, I have to speed up a little bit, uh, but I'm now uh, already at the at the growth implications. Now, just to give you an, an idea on the uh, on the growth implications of uh, of the financial crisis, just look at the, um, uh, at the column on uh, on total potential growth. So, Europe uh, or the Euro area had a had a potential growth average potential growth rate uh, before the crisis of about of about two percent. Um, now, this um, this uh, potential growth rate declined. Uh, to about 0.7 percent, uh, mostly because of a decline in investment rate and, a and an increase in the NAVRU. And our projection will be that um, potential growth will be uh, yeah will be a, a bit higher than uh, than one uh, one percent. Uh, now, if we subtract uh, if we subtract the the effects of from aging uh, from lower uh, population of working age growth. Then uh, the uh, let's say the, the medium-term impact of the crisis would be in the order of magnitude of something like 0 0.6, uh, 0 uh, 0.7 uh, percent. Now um, I'm not sure whether you this is clearly visible, but um, 
this is another this is another way of looking uh, of looking at the situation. Now, if we compare the um, the the uh, both actual growth and potential growth in Europe to uh, let's say optimistic uh, pre-crisis view, then. Um, we uh, have to uh, come to the conclusion that uh, since uh, 2008 or between 2000 or in 2013 we now have a, we we have a, a potential output which is about 10% uh, below the pre-crisis uh, scenario and um, this is very persistent uh, because of these uh, long lasting uh, employment and um, and uh, investment effects and we also project that uh, there will be a, a level shift in, um, in uh, uh, euro area uh, GDP. Now, a similar, uh, recently the Congressional Budget Office in the US has, uh, has published a similar analysis. They also come to the, uh, to the result that the crisis uh, will uh, lower um, a US uh, level of potential output by about 7.3% 7, 7 relative uh, to uh, to a, a pre-crisis uh, projection, so the the order of magnitude of the of the output losses are um, are actually quite uh, quite similar, despite the fact that um, the U.S. has actually engaged in much uh, much more active uh, fiscal and uh, and monetary policy. Now the policy response, uh, as I said. Um, uh, the general policy response in the euro area is, um, and this is advocated, for example, in many uh, Troika programs, uh, is on structural reforms. Um, also, the uh, ECB's OMT program is, uh, is conditional on, uh, on structural reforms. And that's, um, yeah, that's a policy... Uh, uh, a policy uh, program that is uh, that is heavily criticized among uh, among uh, economists, um, so especially uh, Co and Eckerson, but also Krugman, um, are criticizing the uh, structural reform efforts in the in the current juncture, and especially they argue that uh, such uh, such measures uh, can can be counterproductive since. Uh, uh, structural reforms will be deflationary, and since we know that under the zero lower bound they cannot be accommodated by uh, by monetary policy, um, they could actually go in the wrong in the wrong direction, and especially could go in the wrong direction in the in the in the short in the short run, and over the first two or or three years. And um, okay, I will not have much time to. Uh, uh, to go into the details here, uh, let me just, uh, and you may have to, to read uh, uh, then the paper if you want to uh, uh, know a bit more about it. Now we have replicated uh, this, uh, this more theoretical uh, criticism of, uh, of structural reform, uh, uh, of structural reforms using very small, uh, very small macro models with the Commission's uh, Quest model. And um, and um, and there are, there are three there are three uh, extensions uh, which uh, which make I think our model more realistic to to these small macro models which were used for this analysis. Um, namely, um, a standard macro model would also would would look at the impact of structural reforms on investment, which would actually shift the aggregate demand curve. Um, then we have to take into account that currently there are many, uh, many households which are liquidity or credit constraints, so they would not uh, respond to, uh, to changes in, in, in real interest rates. And, uh, sec and third, one has to take into account the fact that uh, Europe and European countries are also trading with the, with the rest of the world. Now, um, very briefly, uh, if we, we to to indicate that according to us, in our view, uh, the um, uh, the uh, structural reforms, um, which are here simulated as a as a one percent shock to both uh, the markup in uh, in the non-tradable sector and the markup in uh, in in the labour market. Um, 
uh, if we, if we uh, simulate such a scenario with, uh, with our macro models, now under, under normal monetary policy condition, if you just look at the, at the GDP effect, this would be a, this would be a gradual effect. Uh, it would gradually become uh, positive. It would never be negative, even in the short run. Now with, uh, un at the zero lower bound, uh, you can have actually some very, very small uh, negative effects. That is, that is correct. But uh, these are not uh, these are not drastic, not not dramatic uh, negative effects, which would uh, actually put such uh, programs uh, uh, in danger. It's it's it, it's more under the zero lower bound. Uh, structural reform measures have more the uh, somehow more delay the, the 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 impact of structural reforms, but they are not uh, they are not leading according to this to uh, to negative results. So I'm I'm skipping my my conclusions and um, in the sake of time. Thanks.